Hello everyone and everything and welcome to more Game Breakdown. And before we even start episode 7, I've actually got a bit of a weird one right here on the menu. These episode title cards are pretty inconsequential, the kind of things you wouldn't even notice if they were gone, but they've got some cool information on them. Don't laugh at my playtime, I have a process. But I bring them up now because all six of the ones prior have used art from the opening cutscenes on their own missions, but episode 7's art is from episode 6's cutscene. Man, shut up me, who cares, let's just jump in. Things just weren't right up in Canada. Random acts of violence were popping up like weeds, and the Northern Lights, well, they just weren't right. One night they'd be brighter than ever, and the next, gone. In Nunavut Bay, I overheard talk between Jean Besson and his mysterious partner, Arpeggio. Somehow, those two are behind it all. This moment always struck me as odd. Like, yes, we did overhear that conversation, but having the cutscene show that moment with Arpeggio actually there is strange. In addition to his being the face of this episode, it seems like the game really wants us to have his image in our minds going forward. Tracking the source of the disturbance was easy. By simply following the lights, we were led north to an immense lumber camp. The sheer number of fallen trees advertised Jean Besson's presence and that he was in possession of the clockwork talons. Pathevius Raccoonus makes numerous references to the talons slicing through plates of steel. A skilled lumberjack like Bassan can clear a forest in hours while wielding the artifacts. Those talons have got to go, both to finally do away with clockwork and to save the environment from his twisted sense of progress. The world just doesn't need to make space for another strip mall. As a kid, I was completely unaware of, well, Canada. I didn't really know anything about the entire country. And getting to this point, I remember being so confused by the A in this mission's title. I read it as like, Menace from the North A. Before we even leave the safe house, this level makes a strong impression. The eagles in the background, the beautiful aurora draped around the lighthouse, it's striking. Are you ready for my most useless bit of sly trivia? That bird call, which you may have heard in a number of movies, is from something called a loon. Send help, these facts just get stuck in my brain, I can't stop them. Okay, so here's what we know. One, Arpeggio's blip is on its way to pick up a battery from Jean Bisson. And two, the only way we'll get a crack at Arpeggio's clockwork brain is by finding a way to sneak aboard his blip. But before we do that, We'll need to snag the clockwork talents off John Besson. Time is short and we've got a lot to accomplish. I like how we have a bit of a to-do list of overarching goals laid out for us at the start here. In all our other missions, we really just had one big objective, so it helps ramp things up a bit. True, true, but first things first. This lumber camp isn't on any of my maps. I need you to poke around and take some recon photos. They'll help to get my sensors oriented. No problem. Recon photos, I got covered. In anticipation of the icy climate, I took the liberty of modifying your cane. Bentley, that's a family heirloom. Did you ask before making massive alterations? It can now separate into two smaller canes. Useful for ice climbing. Try ascending to the top of that sheet of ice. Just jump and hit the circle button to dig in. Ah, well... I can't complain. This is pretty cool. So we're not technically on a mission right now, even though Bentley just gave us our whole briefing with the Binocucom. Which I think makes this technically the only mission in the game that starts without a cutscene of any kind. It's good to see my Cade upgrade perform so well in the field. Now scout the area. I could really use the reconnaissance. Recon, you say? Why, that sounds like a golden opportunity to break down the map in the bottles! Ah, my eyes! Holy crap, this map is blue. Let me see if I can tone that down a bit. Structurally, this map is surprisingly similar to The Predator Awakes, with a number of extremely tall structures and steep drops. It looks straightforward from any given point, but as soon as you try to get around it, you'll find it surprisingly difficult. Here's how we're gonna break it down. We've got this deep thoroughfare down below, which, along with the river, breaks up the map into about four loose sections. Right next to where we started our mission, we've got Bob 
bottle number one. We're gonna hop to what I'll call the lighthouse district and grab one on this log track. Stay sharp on these. These rolling logs aren't lethal, but they're still pretty punishing. Drop down behind this cabin and swing around underneath it to grab bottle three. Jumping up to the top of the cabin, run across these power lines for a bottle, and cross past these big wood stacks for one down at the base of the silo. From there, we're gonna climb all the way back up to the top of the silo to jump over and grab one by the water wheel. A lot of up and down so far. Get used to that. Next, we're gonna cross the river, and I have to say, this river is strangely awesome. There are several points you can cross it apart from the two actual bridges, and all of them are unique. You can use the floating logs, the spire points on the water wheels, the different floating logs, rail walk along these water wheels, it's super gratifying. Anyway, our first bottle over here is at the bottom of the river behind this outhouse. And by the way, these outhouses are just silly. Remember the wolf statues in Prague that could sometimes turn out to actually be wolves? Well, these outhouses can turn out to actually be occupied. The guards that emerge are always a unique variant too, wielding a pickaxe and a shield. Dude, I don't know what you were doing in there, but Basan probably owes you a raise for dropping it just to try and take me out. Fascinating. My sensors detect a Wi-Fi link to that boat. It must be piloted by computer. Head up river from there and we can find a bottle by these water wheels. A treasure on the other side of that building, and from the top of that building we can find a bottle at the bottom of this log track. Climb over this silo to get another bottle on the top of this great big wood pile, and then up the hill next to Bassan's house, where we can find a bottle, a treasure, and a photo. John Bassan's house. The lair of the beast. The dead of evil. The epicenter of ecological destruction. Alright, that's enough milking it, Bentley. John Bassan's really just a guy. Now, this is bizarre. There is a bottle on top of John Bassan's house, and ask most anyone who's played this game how to get up there, and they'll tell you you've got to take this series of ice spikes from over here. But what if I were to tell you you can just climb up this way? Which way, you might ask? This way. Yeah, as I said, bizarre. This section of wall here is climbable ice. You can just barely tell by the melty water particle effect and the slightly protruding geography. I always wonder if this was meant to be a secret or if they just forgot to color it. Anyway, that's our next bottle, and our last one on this side of the river is on the pole by this water wheel. Directly above that, we can cross this wire to another bottle. This place is bear country, all right. Interesting. He's putting out a slight radio signature. I shall name him Barry, and henceforth he shall be my faithful companion. Heck yeah, get him, Barry. Another bottle just a bit downriver from there, and then we've got one smack in the middle of the bear's territory. And two more on these raised areas looking over it. Next, let's use this ice arch to cross to the top of the main sawmill, grabbing a bottle as we go. Up here we'll find one just underneath the far edge of the roof, and another one down on this log track. And a third way down below that one. Climb back up to find another at the end of that log track, grab a picture of the saw blades. Those saw blades look particularly old. I guess this logging camp has been around for a while. And from there, we'll head through this tunnel to grab another. Climb all the way up this arch, grab one there, and then we'll cross this wire for a bottle here. A quick paraglide down to another, and our last one for now is right up these wall hooks towards the end of the canyon. Okay, that should do it. Now for the real point of interest. Head for that lighthouse, and try to find a way to sneak in. Our last two bottles are at that lighthouse. One behind it, and one all the way at the top. Our last treasure is up there too. And that's another set down. Crazy to think we're only gonna do this one more time, huh? A quick bit of missable dialogue from Bentley if you try to take the front door. That door seems to be locked from the inside. Try to find another way in. I was right. The entrance is barred from the inside. Only the finest of locks for Jean Bassan. That's the battery charger, but where's the battery arpeggio's coming to pick up? This spinner, oh man, it's schmoovin'. This is probably the only properly hard photo to take in the whole game, and I just, like, come on, can, can we, uh, 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 there we go. Nailed it. Just looking at that spinner makes me dizzy. Might as well get a shot of old Jean Bisson. Oh, Sly, listen in. He's mumbling to himself. Come on, Jean, you got it in you. Those lumberjack games need some more competition, eh? What would attract the participants? Bullseye! I'll post the clockwork talons as a trophy. That should bring in the competition. Although, who am I kidding, eh? I'm gonna win just like every other year. <laughs> oh, it's tough being this tough. It sure is, yeah. Head back to the safe house. We need to talk about these lumberjack games. No! <laughs>
Well, guys, Jean Bisson has unknowingly thrown down the gauntlet. With the Clockwork Talons as a trophy, we'd be fools not to participate in his lumberjack games. I mean, would we though? We could, I don't know, we could, we could try stealing them, right? Fortunately, due to frequent avalanches, a log chopping guide was frozen in a wall of ice not far from our position. Sly, you're in charge of acquiring the book. I'm sure it will prove invaluable. Man, we can't just like, Google it? Now we're all aware that Arpeggio's blimp is coming to pick up another battery. Bentley says another battery here, like he's gotten at least one before. Does that make sense? I feel like that doesn't make sense. To sneak aboard without incident, I'd recommend we pull a Trojan horse and stow away inside the battery. However, the location of the device is still a mystery. We need some inside information. So, working together, you two will infiltrate the Moose Guard's secret RC combat club. Those guys all work in the lighthouse. If you win the battle, I'm sure they'll talk. Despite his antique mind, Jean Bisson's no fool. To keep tabs on him, we'll need to bug his house. Steal the radio tags off local bears and then jerry-rig them into a sensor array. It's a challenging set of tasks, and that blimp's on its way. Let's get to work! This is gonna be a bit random, but before diving into those tasks, I had a thought. Dare I say, an idea. And my curiosity won't be sated until I've carried it out, so let's talk a bit about some guard behavior we've been seeing throughout the game, but I haven't really drawn attention to yet. The small guard varieties are pretty persistent, but they certainly don't match Sly's acrobatics, and it's incredibly easy to get yourself out of reach of them. When you do this, they'll start just picking up rocks off the ground and throwing them at you. This is honestly pretty genius design. It makes the guards seem a lot smarter and more proactive that they still take some action in these situations. And even though the pebbles don't do much damage, the fact that they do any urges you to take action and get away from the combat. Fantastic ludonarrative resonance that encourages you into that slippery thief mindset. But my question was this, can these rocks kill you? And if so, what does that look like? I took to the streets and didn't take any damage at all. I tried against every guard, and for some reason, though they were clearly hitting me, the rocks were taking no health away. What the heck is going on? Have I glitched the game somehow? Has the game had enough of my antics? In one last effort, I started a brand new file and went to see if that resolved the issue, and it did. Now we can see what dying to this playground bully tactic looks like. Any minute now. So there we go. Now I know, but now the question is, why do the pebbles hurt on a fresh save, but not my current one? I had one hypothesis, so to test it, I set out to get hit by the same attack on both files, and would you look at that? Why did I write that? I don't say that. One attack at two different points in the game does different amounts of damage. This means at some point in the game, we upgraded some kind of hidden defense stat. That's right, Sly 2 has RPG elements. Am I literally the first person to realize this? I can't be, right? Right? Anyway, I, I think we have a job to do or something. Before taking on this job, I want to take a look at the front of this cabin and... I, I, excuse me, guys. I am trying to show something here. Barry, come over here and tell him what's what, okay? So we can see that the front door to this cabin is entirely submerged in snow. Is that something Canadians actually have to deal with? That sounds like a nightmare. Sly, I've detected what appears to be an ancient guide to log chopping that might be useful for the lumberjack games. Unfortunately, it's frozen deep in an ice wall. How are we supposed to get to it? Wait for more global warming? That industrial laser is used to cut through petrified logs. That's interesting, because there's nothing different about this laser from the literal hundreds we've been seeing all game, and those can't cut through a wooden table. If it could be bounced out that window, with your help, I should be able to harness its energy to melt the ice wall and free the book. How do I redirect that thing? There should be a switch on the other side of this wall. Throw it and then head outside. These security lasers have got to be commercially available, right? What's stopping us from just having some of our own? Honestly, you could quite easily miss this one, but tucked away in the corner of this room, we have our vault. If I did my bath right, and I always do my bath right, then the combination has got to be... Five, eight, three. Gadzooks, that's a nice one. Eh, it's alright, Bentley. 
The Lightning Spin is a powerful ability, similar to the Voltage Strike. It instantly takes out any guards it hits, with the major differences being that you don't have to prime it first, you can just rush them. And it can take out multiple foes in one strike. The issue is, it costs a lot of- I guess I haven't mentioned what this orange bar is called yet. Uh, the manual calls this gadget power. But the Lightning Spin puts a huge drain on it, and just because of that, it ends up being my least favorite vault treasure in the game. So we can see the other side of the front door here, with snow actively pouring in through it, and there's even a puddle of melted snow over here. Great detail. Attention all you fellas working the sawmill. Make sure you keep a steady watch. The prowler's been spotted, and we can't not afford to have it if it happened to our long cut equipment. Particularly that laser type saw blade. We're gonna need it once we get to them old oaks up near Lookout Mountain. But hey, you know, you should still enjoy yourself, eh? I mean, how many people get to cut down forests for a living? Ha <laughs> ha, you all are lucky. Don't ever forget that. You've done it! The laser's been redirected out the window! Now to get that laser pointed at the ice wall, you'll need to alter its direction with the crystals I put in your pouch. I see. I just walk to where the laser stops, place a crystal, and it'll bounce the beam to a new position. That log chopping book is as good as ours. The second half of this mission is Sly 2's core gameplay at its best. Crisscrossing all around the map, making use of all our platforming, enemy evading know-how to get this laser where we want it to go. I'm particularly fond of the fact that the laser's endpoint is not shown to us with a waypoint, and you have to keep careful track of it as the laser's route starts to get more complex. Stand clear, Sly! Something else is coming out of the deep freeze! I've never seen such a majestic creature! So full of life, so ready to live! So much for that, he's back in the deep freeze. I feel like I should have something to say about this mammoth, but the only thing about it that really sticks out to me is that it's way smaller than the elephants we've already seen in the game. Oh god, I, I really hope it's not meant to be a baby. Cheer up, pal. We got the log chopping guide. So we finished laser redirection, but before we move on, I want to address that that mission is home to one of the most famous glitches in the original game. This glitch was patched in the PS3 collection, but in the PS2 version, you can pull this off really easily at any point after getting the log chopping guide. All you have to do is head back into that cabin, make your way around the platforming challenge again, triggering Bassan's PA announcement, Attention all you fellas the sawmill. and then head back outside. Once you do, you'll notice that you're technically back in the middle of that mission, even though the laser's not here. And all the mission progress you'd completed past this point will be undone. I have to wonder if this glitch ever seriously affected someone. Like, maybe they'd beaten the game and were just going back through to get the bottles and the vaults, and after running around just a bit too much in that cabin, found themselves with almost a quarter of their progress lost. It has to have happened to someone. And yet, it's actually kinda cool. Unlike the first and third games in the trilogy, Sly 2 has no real way to replay any missions you've already done. And with how many fun mechanics are just one-offs, that's a bit of a shame. So using this glitch to replay a few of the game's last missions was actually a bit of a cheeky workaround back in the day. The wild bears in the area have been tagged with radio tracking devices. If you could snag enough of them, we should be able to set up a receiver array around Jean Bisson's house. I'm always up for bugging someone's home. What? Why did Why did he say it like that? Sly, what? The first step is crawling into that bear cave and stealing the goods. I'm on it. The radio transmitters have all been tagged in their mouths. You'll have to sneak up and pickpocket it while they're yawning. Sounds safe. Stay clear of the thin, crackly ice. Walking on it is sure to wake the bears. I'll keep that in mind. We've escalated our pickpocketing challenge again, now to a tense extreme. At this point, we're more than familiar with the threats bears pose, and sneaking around this cave just praying this whole horde won't wake up is a great way to take things up to 11. Wait, let me get this straight. Feather-footed Sly stepping on this ice wakes up all the bears, but doesn't cause them to so much as stir? Ever curious about what exactly this mission's fail conditions were, I noticed you only fail once you're actually noticed by a bear, so I wondered if I could wake one up without being seen and... It froze. It completely froze the game. <laughs> I crashed it! <laughs> Honestly, with how much I've been throwing at this game, I'm surprised it took until episode 7. Only you could have pulled that off. 
head outside and I'll fill you in on the next step. I like how this route back to the entrance is a bit of a risk. You'd be safer going all the way back around, but a master thief could pull it off. I'm less fond of the fact that stepping on the ice at this point means you have to re-get all six transmitters though. To form a receiver array, you'll have to place the radio transmitters in precise locations around Jean Vissant's base of operations. Seems easy enough. Once you're in position, hit the circle button to place the transmitter. I like how most of the missions at this point are twofold, each one a miniature setup and payoff in their own right. This mission feels like a good partner to our last one, each testing our navigational prowess in different parts of the map. Work up your ears, boys. I'm gonna tell you all the tally for last month. The blue lumberjack team managed to clear cut 128 acres of forest. Not bad considering they had to kill all them badgers to do it, eh? Now, the whole lumberjack team lists their One of our transmitter locations is on top of Jean's house, and I'll let you know now, we never end up going inside of it. That always struck me as odd, especially after Bentley hyped it up so much. Nice work! The array's up and running! Oh, good news! The best of news! We've got an ear on Bassan now, and you already know how I feel about that. Let's hear some of my favorites. We've got a mission to take on as Murray. So now that we're taking him out, I want to point out two power-ups. I said two new power-ups that he has available in the shop. New as of this episode and last episode. The Guttural Roar and the Berserker Charge. Man, those names. I feel like I'm doing boss splits again. Anyway, they're honestly nothing too special. Murray's base set already makes him such an absolute unit that most of his gadgets aren't much worth writing home about. But I want to show off these two specifically for a different reason. The Roar causes all guards in earshot to just drop combat and flee for a moment before they regather their wits, which, while not all that helpful, is certifiably badass. And then the Charge is basically Murray's own version of the knockout dive, so he can knock out flashlight guards he's already engaged with. The reason I bring them up at all though is that these are both things he used when we had to fight him at the end of episode 4. Feels very validating. Like Murray is calling back to an objectively terrible experience and getting something positive out of it. Oh hey Barry, what's up? You wanna tussle with the muscle? Rumor has it that several off-duty guards meet in that cabin for an RC combat club. This is going to be great! I haven't been in any RC combat since that job we pulled in Istanbul. It was awesome! Murray's been hitting us with some real gems in his Binocu conversations these past few levels. I love how we just get to imagine what kind of ridiculous job in Istanbul they pulled that called upon Murray's RC combat skills. But the real gold of these lines goes to the delivery. And Murray's voice actor, Chris Murphy, is honestly such a treasure. You know, just, just let it go! Yeah, baby! Let it all hang out! These icy platforms are trickier than they look. This game doesn't have ice physics, thank god, but these platforms will melt rapidly under your weight. So if you latch onto their ledge or land too far off center, they'll drop you in the drink pretty quick. Those guards will never let you into the combat club without a disguise. That old moosehead should do the trick. Only there's no way for you to get up there. Hide out in this barrel while I send in Sly to steal the head. Forget you, Bentley. What makes you think Murray can't do this himself? Oh, I get it. Sly's the thief. 
Murray's just the big dumb muscle. Even the moose head knows he can't be stolen by just any old lunk, huh? Fine, fine. But Murray almost got a Charlie horse hanging out in that box last episode, so you'd better hurry the heckaroni up with this one, Sly. Sly, if you can get the stuffed moose head without being detected, Murray should be able to join the RC Combat Club without raising any suspicion. Funnily enough, Murray will actually just disappear if you fail this mission. I like to imagine he saw Sly struggling and went, forget it, I'm waiting outside. On the subject of failing this mission though, I want to point out that this right here is the best opportunity to farm money in the whole game. This ruby is near flawless. Four stationary flashlight guards right in a row and you can reset them all and their pockets just by getting spotted. If you are low on coins, I'd first recommend making sure you've snagged all the pedestal treasures. They're what really brings in the big bucks, but this room is a close second. All right, let's actually platform our way around here, and man, this cabin sure is eerily similar to that one from the laser redirection mission. Oh, so you're gonna make me show mercy, eh, game? Well, we'll see about that. It says we're not allowed to fight with the guards or be spotted, but in fact, our actual fail conditions are being within their flashlights or a guard dying. We can actually do whatever we want as long as we avoid those two things, so let's just... Oh. Oh, weird. So apparently when a guard is hit by the insanity strike or the rage bomb, they see other guards, for the purpose of enemy behavior, as members of the Cooper gang. Though their flashlight landing on the other guards fails the mission. Alright, I think we've messed around enough, eh? Murray, heads up! Hey fellas, any of you guys think you can beat the mer- the, the moose? Maybe put a bet on it! Oh, I'm in, eh? I ain't got a lot of money for this wager, but there's no way I'd lose to a new guy like you, huh? That RC combat drone takes some skill to control. Steer with the left analog stick and hold down the X button for gas. After you collect the ball and ammo, press the square button to fire its turret. Here's a pro tip. You can only aim the turret while you're stopped. Oh boy, another vehicle mission, and this one's possibly the weirdest yet. Our left stick controls our maneuvering and our aiming, dependent on whether or not you're holding a button. We've got ammo to run around and collect, but how much we're holding isn't displayed anywhere. The other guy has a flamethrower for close range damage. We can damage ourselves with our own shells if we're not careful. There's a lot to this one. And honestly, I don't feel like I've ever quite gotten to grips with it before the battle is already won, so I guess just... Try stuff till it works. Best advice that I can give is that the tank basically automatically aims the correct distance away, so you can fire from across the arena. So if you are struggling, bide your time and keep your distance. You won, eh? But I ain't got no money. That might be okay. It all depends. Depends on what? On whether or not you know the location of the Northern Light Battery. Oh well. I guess I owe ya. That's some mighty classified information you're after there, strange pink moose no one's ever met before. After reading through the log shopping guide, it's become painfully clear that to win in the lumberjack games, we'll have to cheat. Now I've constructed a plan that hinges around us acquiring an eagle's egg, which is more difficult than you'd think. First, Murray needs to lure a bear into taking out the local oil mains. Once destroyed, the pressurized oil should ignite and create updrafts, which Sly will then use to paraglide over to the eagle's nest, grab an egg, and then head back to the safe house. What the hell, Bentley? This is the most galaxy brain scheme I've ever heard. Somebody explain to me how this is easier than just stealing the talents. Thanks to Murray's undercover work in the RC Combat Club, we've learned that the Northern Light Battery is hidden in a silo nearby. The battery needs some serious modification if we're going to hide inside it to sneak onto Arpeggio's blimp. First, we'll short the battery with grapple lines on local boats. Then, we'll all break into the lighthouse and sever the power flow to the battery. That way it won't recharge. Given my electrical engineering background, this plan has a 97% chance of success. Pretty good, huh? Alright, I feel like Murray got a little short-changed in his last mission. Let's see if we can actually play as him a little this time. If we're gonna get an eagle egg, you'll first have to destroy all the local oil mains. It looks pretty sturdy. The Murray is strong, but his fists can't punch through metal. No problem. See that old bear down there? His name is Grizzleface. The guards ignore him because he's blind and practically nerve dead, except for his sense of smell. If that old guy smells fish, there's no stopping him. 
Use Grizzle Face to take out the oil mains. But I don't smell like fish. Do I? How can I lure him around? Bentley's taken up a post along the river. He'll keep tossing bombs into the water, and the fish should get blown sky high. Plenty should land near your position. So you want me to throw a fish at the oil main so that old Grizzle Face will knock him apart? That's the idea. You might even try throwing fish at the guards. Might improve their odor. This mission would probably be a pretty novel experience if I weren't already an expert at manipulating the bears, but I'll bite. The struggle with this job is navigating the cliffs. Grizzleface can't jump or really fall either, and getting to all these oil mains along the ground is not easy if you don't really know the map, which you probably won't because there's been no need to until now. But you can actually make this mission as easy as you want it to be. You don't literally have to lead Grizzleface around by the nose. Just hang out near your objective with a fish and he'll pathfind his way all the way to you. I also appreciate Sly's little lines that assure you that this is a valid way to go about things. That bear can run pretty fast. He's on the way. Grizzleface is moving towards your position. Solid work, Murray. Now that the oil lights are exposed, Sly's all set up for a paragliding job off the lighthouse. Grizzleface is also just kind of sweet. Like, look at his little face. He won't attack you no matter what, only the guards. Though I feel I should probably acknowledge the elephant in the room. And the pigeons and the bear. All these wild animals existing directly alongside anthropomorphic animals raises some really odd questions. Why is this what an elephant looks like if this is what a rhino looks like? Why are there bats flying around Prague, but also bats walking around Prague wearing clothes? This is the exact sort of thing Disney's been getting away with for like a hundred years now, so what's up? Well, the in-universe answer is probably something along the lines of humans live alongside wild primates. From the outside looking in, that might actually seem like a bit of a contradiction. So who's to say that these aren't all just more intelligent varieties of the same family of animals? But the real reason is that creating caricatures of these animals instead of populating the world with people serves to convey ideas quickly. Sly being a raccoon helps us get immediately on board with him being a thief, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. They're not just fuzzy animal friends because it's a kid's game. Almost every character's species serves as narrative shorthand for something, and it's yet another detail that helps elevate this game above the crowd. Though, through this lens, I can't make heads or tails of that moose head from the last mission. The more I think about it, the, the weirder it gets. If we can trust Murray's informant, that's the silo with the battery hidden inside. To prepare it for travel, we'll have to drain off its northern light energy. By attaching a boat's grappling hook to the top of the silo, we should be able to deplete power from the battery. Murray's in position to help throw you out onto the boat. Once on board, I'll hack into its steering controls and move the vessel close enough to fire its grappling hook. Okay, I'll climb on top of the silo and attach the hooks. How many grappling lines will it take to drain the battery? Three should suffice. Once the first line's attached, Murray and I will commandeer another boat. You should stay in position. Finally, I get the easy gig. Nah, what do I need Murray for? I got a jetpack. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I didn't realize. I'm all set to throw you to that boat. These days, my aim is impeccable. Now, game, I can't help but notice that this level is gonna have three hacking objectives. Now to hack the steering controls. These new hacking enemies make things pretty interesting. They drop obstacles rather than shoot you, which can make things pretty crowded very quickly. Along with them being melee enemies that are incredibly tanky compared to the red ones, and we've got a fun challenge in knocking out the firewall. Mind you, my favorite part of this level is seeing how few of these red dots I can get away with actually destroying. Nice work hacking the autopilot. The boat's heading into position. I'm already on top of the silo. Shoot the grappling hook up to me, and I'll make sure it gets attached to the battery. Weird how we've got both Murray throwing Bentley and Sly catching grappling hooks. Both skills that came into play in our very first heist that we've not seen since. The hook's in place. You guys should head out for another boat before anyone picks up on what we're doing. Golly gee, game, this level sure looks similar to the last one. The second hook's in place. One more grapple line to go, and this thing will be on empty. If you get too far from Murray as you run along here, dude will freaking Mongo jump to you. I was wondering what happened to that guy. Guess he just prefers to be frozen. Okay, fine. Honestly, this is the first time I feel like the trio of hacking level structure is kind of justified. There is a lot going on in this last room with the amount of enemies and bullets flying. But it's not like I'd be complaining if the prior two levels were, like, shaped differently, at least. did it! With the battery chamber empty, we'll be all set to move in! 
That lighthouse is the conduit for collecting the northern lights. We need to shut it down, or the silo battery will continue to fill with energy, making it impossible for us to stow away inside. So, you want me to go in there and bust the thing up? Sounds like work for Murray. Actually, this job will require all three of our skills. The front door is locked, and you're the only one capable of climbing up to the hatch on top. Once inside, sneak down to the ground floor and let us in. We'll help you finish the job. Alright, see you on the ground floor. Man, I gotta address those northern light reflections. In almost any game made before ray tracing was super prevalent, objects reflected in glass or water or shiny floors were usually reflected by just having an identical entity on the other side, in reverse. Since actually simulating a reflection is a lot more taxing than just adding more models. So that's exactly what you're seeing here. Which is why, and I don't say this lightly, it looks so bad. But fret not, this is just one more thing I can pin on Sanzaru. Seems to be some sort of layering issue that happened while upscaling, cause it looks just fine in the original. If anything, I gotta admire the ambition. Seeing how fast you can climb this lighthouse is a lot of fun. The snapping with the ice pick move is super generous, so you can make some crazy looking jumps with it. These electric pulses coming up the center make jumping straight down impossible. So seeing just how fast you can make it down is also a ton of fun. Whoa, Bentley. Chill. Thanks, pal. Just let me at that Northern Light attractor. It'll be slagging minutes. Not quite that simple, Murray. I'll reverse the energy flow from the control computer while you lift the main circuit breaker. That should give Sly a short window of opportunity to climb up the power lines and overload the system from the top. Up, down, up, down. They should put an elevator in this place. Get climbing, Sly. We can't keep this thing reversed forever. Yeah, this is heavier than it looks. Now we can climb up the ropes in the center. The unclimbable sections and these electric pulses forcing us to switch from rope to rope makes this another fun challenge, which we can also completely bypass by just taking the stairs. Man, you gotta stop letting me get away with this. It only encourages me. Hmm. There's a switch that I can flip, and Bentley told me to flip it. Hold on, I can figure this out. Flip the double reverse circuit breaker! Hurry! Stop shouting at me, Bentley, I'm trying to figure this out! Honestly kind of bizarre that this even has a time limit when there's no timer on screen or any kind of indication as to how much time we have. Not to mention it's such a generous amount, I didn't even know you could run out of time until right now. Okay, this one scared me. Sly 2 reuses surprisingly few sound effects from the first game, but the sound they use for this thing breaking is the same as when those cars fall from the roof in Sunset Snake Eyes. Even I don't know how I noticed that one. My powers are becoming too great. In order to overcome Jean Bisson in the Lumberjack games, we'll need to enlist the help of the giant Canadian eagles. Their nest is out on that iceberg. Steal one of the eggs, and then bring it safely back to the safe house. We'll use it to direct the eagle's protective instincts against Bissan. Sure, sounds easy enough. Except for the part where I have to swim a half a mile through freezing water. Why swim when you can paraglide? With the oil mains all destroyed, the pent-up combustible materials have just caught fire. I see. The updraft created by the flame should give me some extra altitude. Just make sure to stay out of the fire. Get too close, and old Grizzleface will be eating barbecued raccoon for dinner. That's a charming image, Bentley. I love how Sly and Bentley are just trading back and forth extremely violent ideas for each other's deaths. Like, that is officially one of their friendship dynamics. Man, there is super not a lot to this one. 
This could almost have been a tutorial mission for the paraglider if we hadn't had it for almost three full episodes now. Except that dodging these eagles at the end can actually be a bit tricky. If you give them too much space, you'll fall a bit short and have to do the mindless first two minutes of the flight again. Excellent job! If you could get that eagle egg back to the safe house, we'll be all set for the lumberjack games. Great work, Sly! The Lumberjack Games are upon us. Now, despite Murray's study of the long chopping guide, none of us are skilled enough to beat John Basson at his own game. So, though it pains me to say it, we'll have to cheat. So we're going through with this instead of trying to nab the talents by literally any other means. It's an interesting character beat for the gang that this is the plan, likely informed by how smoothly stealing not one but three parts went last episode. This plan is essentially built to rub Basan's nose in it. We're not just gonna take the talents, we're gonna upstage this man at his own event and he's gonna hand them to us as a prize. After all, what's he gonna do? He's 150 years behind the times. Murray, you'll participate in the power log chopping competition. Get us a good score, and then let Basan up for his turn. While he's chopping, I'll sneak the eagle egg into his trousers, and the protective parents should disturb his axe swings. I just realized how utterly unfeasible it is for Bentley to have pictures of this. I now have to assume that these slides aren't pictures at all, but highly detailed 3D renderings Bentley makes while the other boys are carrying out the missions. Sly, given your ascension skills, I've signed you up for the ice wall climb. We'll keep Hassan from beating your score by pulling him off the wall with some nearby grappling lines. And finally, I'll represent our team in the log rolling competition. With my knowledge of rotational mechanics, we're sure to get a stupendous score. Alright, what am I looking at here? I'm assuming R is short for rotations and psec is short for per second, so essentially what you've written here is log equals rotations per per second. The brains of the operation, ladies and gentlemen. Sly will be in charge of greasing Basad's logs, so he has no chance of beating it. If you guys are ready, I say we head out and show these meathead lumberjacks what we're made of. Oh, lumberjack games, lumberjack games. I'm gonna play me some lumberjack games. Gonna split me some lumberjack wood. And that's always good. So on this file, I haven't gotten the alarm clock gadget yet. And you get a unique line from Bentley if you try to head out without buying it first. We're all ready for the Lumberjack games, so you should probably buy an alarm clock gadget first. You never know when you'll need one. This makes the alarm clock one of the only required gadgets in the game, alongside the paraglider. Though, thinking about it, since I love the glider so much, I've never seen if there's a unique voice line for not buying it by the heist. Let me rectify that real quick. Sly, you'll need a paraglider for the heist. Once you buy one, we can get things started. Okay, guys, let's head down there and win those talons from Jean Bissot. Sly, try to keep a low profile when we get close. We don't want him to recognize you. Man, I guess we really lucked out that the games are happening literally right now. Isn't it like 2 a.m. or something? Before we're getting started, we can actually go check out the setup here. We've got the logs and this giant climbing wall that seems to have been constructed just for this event. Man, bassan has got budget. Excuse me, sir. We humble lumberjacks would like to participate in your lumberjack games. Think you got what it takes to win the clockwork talons, eh? Well, I'm sure enough gonna let you play, so long as you pay the entry fee. Much obliged, partner. We'll, uh, just take our positions for the competition. Does Bentley need to do a voice here? He's just openly mocking Jean now, isn't he? Enjoy the moment while you think you still got a chance. It's as close to winning as you'll ever get. This year's first event will be a power chopping contest. Not like anyone's ever gonna beat my record, but let him try. Okay, this job is my freaking nightmare. This mission has 23 unique voice lines from Jean Basson, all for failing the mission under unique conditions. And every single one of them is chosen from a random pool of at least three. So if I want to show off some of my favorites, I'm gonna be here a while. Your technique is pathetic, big man. Where'd you learn to chop? From a book? <laughs> I was actually expecting better from a big fella like you. Not bad, hippo. But watch and learn as I destroy that log without even breaking a sweat. Okay, Bentley, you're on. Plant the eagle egg on Bassan, 
and the angry eagle parent should swoop in and throw off his axe timing. Man, how, how many eggs were in that egg? Bullseye! That chomp was almost as good as my first chomp back in 1831. And old Betsy comes through again. It's an old axe, but a good one. Ooh, an attack by an eagle. Skill issue, skill issue for sure. What? I think you better rethink them scores, boys. What you intended to give me was perfect tens, right? So as this mission progresses, we'll see more evidence that the judges are basically in John Bassan's pocket. But like, you're telling me they didn't see this entire ass Bentley sneak up behind Bassan? So your pink friend knows how to handle an axe. Let's see how you handle a vertical wall of ice. Ooh, not fast enough, you little varmint. These judges have surprisingly complex programming to them. They'll choose what number to give based on how well or poorly you did on each event, but there's also a slight degree of randomness to them. So apart from the perfect tens, you'll pretty much never get the same score twice. That's a lot of effort considering these minigames are all essentially just pass-fail. Pretty good for a scrawny raccoon. Now, watch and learn as I demonstrate the art of power climbing. Hurry! Use those grapples to hook onto Bison! You will need to hook him with all three lines to pull him off the wall. And really, this is not even remotely subtle. Forget the judges, how does Bassan not notice this? Applause for that masterful display of climbing! This is a weird one. The sound files they use for Bassan climbing are some of Dimitri's voice lines? It seems you have pulled the wrong cards again. Did I ever tell any of you the story about the judge from last year's competition who mistakenly gave me a score other than 10? I see we're tied with only one event to go. Unfortunately for you, I've saved my best event for the last. The spinning log competition. Okay, looks easy enough. I just need to stay out of the water. Okay, I really like this. These logs can be tricky. As simple as it seems, the timing of it is really satisfying. Those little legs of yours just can't move fast enough. You turtles aren't good at nothing. A log rolling turtle. Who ever heard of such a thing? Yeah, he's prejudiced, but you guys have profiled some characters based on species in the past, so I wouldn't feel too superior. You're one lucky turtle. I'll give you that. But now... Watch how a skilled log roller does it. This is crazy. John Bisson's got those judges so intimidated, there's no way he can lose. You're right, Murray. Those guys need to go. Okay, I'm just making this up on the fly, but what if I were to lure the judges one by one into that cave? Once inside, you two will knock them out and take their clothes. Ingenious! Is it though? Is it really? What if we just replaced one of them? Or like, what if we had Sly steal their 10 cards? I know things are going wrong, but this definitely seems like the time to regroup and try something smarter. When all three judges have been restrained, we'll be able to don our disguises and take their place at the judges' table. Sly, you can use the alarm clock gadget to distract the judges and lure them into the cave. That's a great plan, Sly, but you'll have to move fast. Once John Bisson finishes the log rolling event, the gig is up! Was there ever any question of my supremacy? Undefeated for 20 years, ever since 1847. What? I thought I 
warned you judges about the consequences for incorrect scores. Wait a sec. You aren't the judges I hired. It's the scrawny raccoon and his annoying friends. Well, if you want the talent, then why don't you just take him? So our thematic word of the day is hubris. Would the gang have even considered such a pitiful last second plan against the Contessa, or even Dimitri? We had every reason to be overconfident, but now, we'll see what underestimating our opponent gets us. Oh, my aching head. Those talons really pack a punch. Sly! Murray! Wake up! Yeah, I'm awake, but not so loud. I have a splitting headache. Whoa. Where are we? What's going on? This looks like the sawmill control room. Bisson must have thrown us in here for interrogation later. I, for one, would like to escape before he returns. It looks like we're pretty well sealed in here. Unless... Unless what? Unless you can fit through that hole. I... I think I could squeeze through there. I'll drop down and try to free you guys from the outside. If there's any trouble, I'll call with this walkie-talkie. You might be able to help me with these sawmill controls. While you guys do that, I'll try prying open that steel door. Given enough time, I might be able to make some progress. Sounds like a plan. Good luck, Bentley. And remember to shout if I can help you from up here. You okay? I can't see you from in here, but I heard the fall. I'll be fine. Just give me a moment to catch my breath. Well now, Candy Bridges. I should have figured a puny turtle like you'd find a rat hole to squirm through. Well, I just dropped my glasses, had to come pick them up. I ain't like you, boy. I ain't stupid. When y'all were unconscious, me and my boys paid a visit to your hideout and found all them clockwork parts. Lucky thing, too. Arpeggio is willing to plunk down a king's ransom for the whole lot. I even threw in the talons. You sold all the clockwork parts? Arpeggio has them all? That's a big deal. Everything we've worked for all in the hands of the Claw Gang once again? I wouldn't expect one of your kind to understand the finer points of commerce. You turtles are too stupid to know a woodcutter from a woodchuck. That's it! Time I showed you just how stupid we turtles really are. Sly, on my command! I hear ya. Prepare yourself, Bissad! On guard! Okay, Walnut. Get ready for a smushin'. Call out which lever I should pull. No time to consider that bombshell though, it's time for a boss fight. A peculiar one. Bentley may be frail, but that's not really a factor here. With total control over the sawmill's mechanisms, we don't even have to get close to Bassan to lay the smack down. This is really elegant design too. The buttons mapped to each function were chosen very deliberately, so memorizing them only takes a second. Square for these fires, circle to drop the logs, and triangle for the pointy saw blades. Despite his future faces incorporating a dynamite ranged attack and goose reinforcements, the only real complication in this fight is avoiding the hazards we summon. Though this ends up being pretty easy. Don't miss out on his victory taunts though. Take that! Puny little turtle. Looks like I'm tougher than you are clever. Dizzle is dizzle. Uh, tarnation! I've been done in by some four-eyed turtle. Times have changed. Once again, brains triumph over broad. Good job, little buddy. That was some fast thinking. Don't forget about me. You did a great job opening that door, Murray. Thanks! Uh, attention, uh, John Bisson! Arpeggio's, uh, carrier blimp will, uh, arrive to pick up the Northern Light battery in exactly one minute. Okay, enough patting ourselves on the back. If we're going to get the clockwork parts back, we need to get onto that blimp. The silo battery isn't far. If we run, we can make it. Enough talk, let's move! Shake a leg! That blimp's on its way! 
All right, now we've got to freaking go. One minute, more or less. That means the difference between everything and nothing. As we shut ourselves into the Northern Light Battery, it became black. For a few long minutes, we just sat there in darkness. No one dared to talk for fear that John Bassan's men might discover where we were hiding. Time seemed to have stopped. And then, we felt it. We were being lifted up to Arpeggio's blimp. It was all so strange. The focus of all our schemes had been stolen from us. Our clockwork parts were gone. Looking around the inside of the battery, I knew we all felt it. Failure. That is an extremely deliberate choice of words. Oh my god, we've failed? After everything we've overcome, the slowest, least complicated villain we face just took it all away? It seems impossible, and yet the reality sets in here. I was twitchy and ready for action. Any action. Bentley tried to make some sense of the situation by drawing up meaningless plans. But Murray? Murray took it the worst. He just sat there sobbing while the team van floated away over the horizon. That van was his life. I knew I'd have to find a way to make it up to him. Somehow, even after we've had the wind knocked out of us, reeling with the hits we've already taken, that's what ends up hurting the most. The team van has been a constant since our earliest days. Losing it is like losing our cane. But that's it. Episode 7. Much like Episode 3, it's difficult to talk about when the weight of that final cutscene is looming over our heads. How can I discuss things like level structure and highlights when we've just fallen so far? But I have to, because god do I love that level. In conjunction with Episode 6, it is Genius! Setting us up like bowling pins. Every single mission until the heist is the gang operating at their best. Many of them being strong displays of teamwork as two or more of the gang join their skill sets to make it happen. But that finale, pulling the rug out from under us like that, is not an easy thing to do. But now we've only got one episode left. If you want to see the next video, that's right, the finale of Sly 2 right now, it's already live on my Patreon, available to every tier. I hope to see you there. Thank you.